the last time we got together, we began the study in Daniel. And we opened up to this, the very first chapter of Daniel. And there were two conclusions, basically, that we said coming out of Daniel. We know it's the southern kingdom. Judah has been taken off into exile. Um, Daniel and three of his friends, uh, Hananiah, Azariah, Azariah and Mes Mishael. Mishael. Those three. We don't, we don't learn, we don't remember those names very well. We remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? But those are pagan god names. There are, they are Chaldean names. Their other names are relating to God. Okay. So he's been taken away, right? And <clears throat> I said that this particular book is not about Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, or Mishael. This book is not about how can we walk really, really well and be more like Daniel and pray better and do more and be more. And uh, although those things we may be able to look at and go, oh, I, Lord, make me more like that. That's not the purpose of Daniel. Daniel is written in two parts. You have the historical part, the, the story part in the first six chapters. And then in the seven through the remainder chapters, you have all that prophecy, dreams and visions and future events and things like that. And I said, if you want to understand Daniel, you want to get through Daniel and, and be able to keep things where they belong. Remember that this particular book is about the sovereignty of God against everything else. This is God against every king, every kingdom, every government, every whim, every will of man, everything. And God is going to put his power authority on display for the number of chapters that we're going to be looking at throughout all of Daniel. If you keep that in your mind and you go through the stories, it takes on some pretty interesting uh, characteristics. One that I got this when I was doing the study in chapter 2. We're going to go through chapter 2 today. It's a very common story. Everybody, I think, knows this story. And there's been so much written about chapter 2 and this great statue that Nebuchadnezzar has this dream about. The golden head and the silver arms and, and chest and, and the... The bronze torso belly and then the clay legs that turn into, or, or the iron legs that turn into this clay iron mixture foot toesy thing. And this big rock that, that comes out of this mountain and crushes the statue and Nebuchadnezzar. And, you know, who is the, who is the golden head? Well, you know, we find out that's Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And, well, Oh, let's spend our lifetime discovering who is this silver one and who's the, the next one. Who, and you know what? You get lost. You've lost the picture. You're already off topic. You're not where Daniel wants you to be or God wants you to be in the story of Daniel. So what I want to do is I, I want to start this lesson by asking you a question. Okay? Why should we trust in the sovereignty of of God? Or should I ask, what is the sovereignty of God? You asked this question in class or in assembly one time. What is the sovereignty of God? Let's start there. What is the sovereignty of God? When we say that, what do we mean? He is all powerful. All powerful. All mighty, all knowing. All. He's just all. He's just all. He's in control of everything. He is in control of everything. I think more than. Many of the other little nuances that we tag on with the all, I think that one's the one that's most dominant in our head. He is sovereign. He has total and absolute control and authority over everything. Whatever the sovereign, the king says, goes. He don't have to ask us about it. He don't have to ask us about it. So my question is, why do you trust in the sovereignty, the authority, the power of God. Because he's sovereign. He's perfect, he's <laughs> sinless, and he is all good. Okay, but he's also... All powerful. And a consuming fire, and perfectly holy, and... 
uh, he, there's many things that he is, but when we, when we think of his sovereignty, do we think of his sovereignty in that respect? Do we think of him in the respect of he's all these other things? No, I, no, I think you look at it in a fear. I mean, because you, you would fear not. Yeah? No. Okay. Well, what I want to do is I want to... You don't fear God? Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. What are you saying? That's what I mean. I mean, what was your question again? Why, what, Why do we trust in the sovereignty of God? And her comment back was... I would fear not to. She would fear oh, oh, not okay. to... Trust in the sovereignty of God. Now, there's a difference between, and I'll, I'll beg, uh, not beg this. I will, I will ask this question. I'll pull it, and that is, is, is trusting in the sovereignty of God necessitate a fear of God? Meaning, be, do I? You said, I dare not. I fear to not trust in God's sovereignty. Uh, I will challenge that we do not trust in the sovereignty of God for another reason. And we're going to find that out as we go through chapter 2. This is what, what I think is behind chapter 2. This is, again, we talked about this is God showing His sovereignty. He's going to put it on display, and we're going to see it on display in chapter 2. And I want to see if you can pick out what, what is particular about this revelation or revealing of God to these people. Okay? What was that? So, let's do some reading. Chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 9. If you look through chapter 2, I broke it down into uh, very similar to like a, a play. If you ever read a play, there's Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, Act 4, whatever. I believe that I could break this down into four acts. That's what we've done for our outline. Four acts. The first act is God sets the stage. Okay? Here's God setting the stage. And you tell me why. Verse, uh, uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what, had, what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever! Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your house turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more, they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time. Because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, then or there is just one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. Okay. So this is God setting the stage. Remember, he's going to put his sovereignty on display. He wants to show himself to the world. So we have, uh, we have a king, Nebuchadnezzar. He's the big hotshot of the day. He is the king of Babylon. And he has a dream. It's an it's a okay dream? What do you think, oh, Kennedy? Disturbing dream. How disturbing do you think it is? His mind is troubled. His mind is troubled. And he could not sleep. You think he can't sleep? No, he could not sleep. It's 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 okay. Sleep. All right. I'm just. I'm waiting for you to answer back. This is. This part is all interactive. You can answer back. What? If he wants, it's so disturbing that he's having his music magicians and sorcerers not only interpret but also tell him what the dream is. So. Clearly, whatever the dream is, obviously, has rocked him to his core, I would suspect. Wonderful answer, Tracy. Yes, this dream is so troubling, it has, as Tracy says, rocked him to his core. He knows that this is something big. It is so troubling, so heavy. Mind you, it says dreams, plural. Perhaps he had it multiple times. 
This is a tormenting dream. This is something that will not allow him to sleep. And so he goes to those that he would normally go to, the magicians, the sorcerers, the great fortune tellers of the day and of the land, and he says, it is so troubling, it is so important that I know the absolute truth about this particular dream. I know it's that important. I'm not going to even tell you what the dream is. Instead, in order to know that you have a proper interpretation of the dream, I want you to tell me what the dream was and the interpretation. How serious is it? How serious is he on getting an answer? Oh, very. very. Oh, very? Oh, very. How very? Well, death penalty serious. Yeah. Death penalty serious. Not just death penalty, cut him to pieces. <laughs> Not only cut him to pieces, but do Your what? Yes, I'm going to go to your house. I'll just burn it all down to, to, to nothing. I'm going to get you all. So he's pretty, something's, something's very, very wrong. This is a very heavy, heavy, heavy issue. This is not a little something. Okay. Now I want to just point out in verse 4, see where it says, Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic. Well, not only did they answer in Aramaic, but the writer of Daniel also changes his writing to Aramaic. So he starts in Hebrew, going from, from uh, the process of coming out of Judah, going into exile, with the Hebrews coming out, that first part, it's Hebrew. Now, God is going to display his sovereignty in a pagan world, pagan nation, to a pagan king. And the language changes to the pagans' language. Aramaic is the Chaldeans' language. So anybody in Daniel's day or after who was not Hebrew could pick up Daniel and read what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Which is pretty cool, if you think about it, in God's plan of getting his, his, his character, his nature, his message, his gospel, I suppose, brought out into the world, he actually writes in their language. That's pretty cool. Anyway, so that's just a side note. Okay, well, what do you think? Do you think the magicians are, you know, they're like, oh, this is a breeze. No problem. No, they're obviously they're scared. <laughs> they are scared. <coughs> They're scared. They are scared. Yes. Let's read the magician's confession, which is in verses 10 and 11. The astrologers answered the king, There is not a man on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great or mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. Uh -huh. Are we starting to get a feel for what this stage is going to be a contest about? Sure. <laughs> yes. The, there's no man who can answer it. No king would expect an answer. It's too difficult. There's no one who can reveal it except the gods, and gods aren't here. They're out there somewhere. So, <clears throat> what is the king's response? Angry. You're right. You're right, guys. I'm so sorry I put that burden on you. <laughs> no. He told him to start killing the wise men. Yep. Look at look at the look at the death sentence that's decreed in verses 12 and 13. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Okay, I got a question for you. Where was Daniel? He was with them. He was part of that group. No, he, was no, he wasn't part of the group that was called. Where is, they went to go look for Daniel. He was yeah, probably on his porch praying. Maybe on his porch praying. Well, I thought that Daniel was uh, <clears throat> uh, in the inner circle. Yeah, in that particular inner circle. Not yet. 
<laughs> he's not in the inner circle yet. Well, then why were they looking for him? Because he was one of the magicians, wise That's men. What he said. Ah, he was being but it, no, his training was finished. Remember where we? He is in that same group. They were looking for him. But they were looking for him. He's in the same group, but he was not called. He was not presented to the king yet. They never asked Daniel and his friends, what do you think? No, I know, but I assume that's why they were looking for him, because they were going to put all the wise men Correct, together. correct. But my, 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 maybe it was my, my questioning that was, that was misleading. My questioning is, where was Daniel in the beginning? Was Daniel a part of the group of magicians that came before the king and said, King, no, if you just tell us the, the dreams... He was just part of the group. And so instead of the king saying, well, uh, since you upper level magicians and my top advisors can't get it, I'm going to kill you. Let's go to the next group and we'll pull the next group. Maybe the juniors, maybe the ones who have just stepped into out of training. Maybe we could ask them what the answer is. He didn't do that. He just said, wipe them all out. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So the king's furious. He's at his wit's end. He has no recourse. He comes to the end of his own strength, his power, his understanding. So he lashes out in fury. And he orders the execution of all the wise men. Executioners are sent to Daniel and his friends to kill them. Uh, and I already said, note that, his, that Daniel and his friends were not called to give answers to the dream initially. No. They're just going to pay the penalty because the other, the upper guys, the ones that have been there, the veterans, didn't get an answer. However, even though they're low, the low men on the totem pole at this point, we know from reading Daniel that they're going to end up being basically presidents yeah. over Nebuchadnezzar's empire. So the question that we need to ask in the back of our head is, how does God, in his workings, take nobodies and raise them to levels of prominence? Make them presidents. Is this, is God doing this? Is God moving Daniel from low man on the totem pole and making him number one guy yes. in all of the empire? Part of the through, this is through the uh, workings of the king, though. Through the workings of the king. So it's not Daniel who's doing this. No. Right. Okay, this is, this is all about God doing this, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Keep watching because it's going to keep, God's just, he's not done. God is going to keep opening himself more and more and more and more. And that by the time you get to the end, you'll understand how the end gets there. What, what happens at the end. You'll understand all of the exaltation and everything. <clears throat> I, I wrote down in my notes, I said, at, uh, be sure to say, or be sure to remind everybody that at this point, Daniel is no more able to reveal the king's dream than were the magicians. There is nothing within Daniel at this point, right now, that Daniel can claim, oh, I got the answer to that. He wouldn't have asked for time. Right. If he, if if he, did. he didn't want Correct. to consult the one who had the answer. That's right. So here we go. Act 2. The stage has been set. Act 2. God enables Daniel. We're going to read verses 14 through verses 18. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might be, not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Okay. So Azariah comes to kill Daniel. Daniel asks what's wrong. With I'm wisdom and... Oh, no, excuse me, I'm sorry, Arioch. Arioch comes to kill Daniel. Daniel asks what's wrong. Arioch explains the situation. Daniel goes to the king and says, please give me time. Then goes back home. Apparently he was granted time. 
So he goes back home, gets a hold of Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Question, why aren't they called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? That isn't the, their Hebrew name or Jewish name. That's pagans, God's name. Hananiah, Azariah. That's a Hebrew name. That's, his, that's their back, Hebrew name. We're back in Hebrew. Yeah, but Shadrach, Hebrew. Meshach, and Abednego was the name that they gave them. Correct. So why, are, why when it brings them up again, is it not bringing them up as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Because they're, in the Hebrew, they're going to their Hebrew God. Thank you. Yes. They're not going to some gods. Some, some indiscriminate nobody idol, they're going to the God in heaven, the God of heaven. And they are going as his people. And so Daniel says, guys, plead for mercy that, the, that this mystery will be revealed. Wonderful. I love this. Well, what happens? Does God reveal the mystery to him? Verse 19 through 23 during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and season. He sets up kings and disposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Did he get his answer? Yes. Yeah. All right. Factual fervent prayer of a Daniel gets an answer. That's what this story is about. No, it's not. It's about God showing, again, revealing himself. So this is all God revealing himself. It was all part of God's plan. It's all God revealing himself. This is about God. This is not about Daniel. Daniel's just an instrument. Should we pray? Yes. But I remember my question in the beginning. Why should we trust in the sovereignty of God? Daniel trusted in the sovereignty of God, put his life down, believing God, his God, the God of his fathers, would or could reveal this dream. Could bring his authority to bear on this particular scenario, right? And save, I mean, his, his plea is, God of our fathers, reveal this mystery so that we don't die. Help us in our circumstance. Get us out of this circumstance. You have the power to change things. We know you are all powerful. You're the Almighty. You're El Shaddai. You are all those things. So we're calling on the one that we know that can change our circumstance. Lord, change it. Make it better. Help us. Rescue us. But why would he do that? Why would he trust in that? Keep that in the back We're going to come back to this prayer a little bit later. Act 3. Daniel introduces the God in heaven who reveals mysteries. This is verses 24 through 30. And my voice is starting to, to go out. Uh, is there somebody that has a good, strong voice that could read this? Uh, feel comfortable with it? You'll read it? Okay, do you mind reading loudly? Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belshazzar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. Continue. Through 30, please. 
As you are lying there, O king, your mind turned to the things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than other loving men, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Okay, let's stop right there. This is Daniel introducing this pagan king to the God who reveals mysteries. Don't let that just go by as it's nothing. There's, there's, there's importance in that. Very, very big importance in that. What is it that God has put into Nebuchadnezzar's mind? That he's the man. Uh, not that, I know you mean say when he's the man, it doesn't mean that God's the man, but I mean, what is it, what were the dreams about? The future. Pertaining, the future, thank you. Yes, God has put in your mind visions and dreams about things to come, things in the future. And he has given me the interpretation, or he's given me, revealed these things to me, these mysteries to me, so that you will know that the interpretation is right. That it's real. This is, this is the deal. Okay? Pretty simple. There's not a whole lot, you know, to this other than that. So, Daniel points to the revealer. There, I know no man, no enchanter, no magician can reveal this. And I can't either. However, let me introduce you to my God. Yes. The real God. <laughs> the real God. The revealer. The God in heaven. So let's see what happens. So God, or Daniel tells what the king's dream is all about. Here we go. Starting in verse 31. You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and made like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Okay. Pretty awesome dream. What did he see? What did he, he see? What the king saw. What, what did the king dream? Go ahead. Tell me, Kennedy. You know you're looking at the eyeball. you like, is he going to ask me this question? A statue. Very good. Very good. Not bad. Have a four-year-old upstage you there, Kennedy. He saw, he saw in his dream what was an imposing, indestructible, supposed character. And, and you know, a head of gold and bronze and iron. And you think of something mighty and, and that cannot be broken. And, and you have this rock that smashed it to pieces. So what I'm thinking of is that it, it was... It, it's just a, a, a basically, I don't know, a metaphor? Not a metaphor. It's a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We're, 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 no matter how big and imposing and strong or whatever, God is in control, and with just a nitty bitty pebble or rock, it can completely destroy. Well, it, it what wonderful. I love, I love the, what you're doing. I love what you're doing. You're, you're trying to put some meaning behind it, like, you know, what would Nebuchadnezzar thought about this imposing, awesome, mighty statue, mighty thing that's, that's, you know, incredible, and then this rock, and you know, how God, what? If I had that dream, it wouldn't bother me. It wouldn't bother you? <clears throat> no. Unless it no, I, I, it wouldn't bother me a bit. Well, I would think <clears throat> a big statue, and it crumbles, and a rock grows into a mountain. That's not a scary dream I to think, me. I think I that the, God is telling you a message that you will feel that there is a meaning, even if you don't understand, and you will think upon it because you will have that feeling that sounds Okay. Because I think Nebuchadnezzar looked at himself as that statue. You think Nebuchadnezzar saw him as a statue? Well, you thought that perhaps rather, I mean, because 
that maybe it was about him, yeah. that there was, but, but remember now, Nebuchadnezzar's pagan. He doesn't know the God of Daniel. No, but that's why it bothers him. He, I think why, why would that bother him? I, don't, I can't be afraid of something I don't know. Yes, you can. Why? What do you mean, why? Everybody's always afraid of the unknown. If, if, mm -hmm, if, if mm -hmm, you're subconsciously mm -hmm. thinking uh -uh. that you're this huge and wonderful person like Nebuchadnezzar thought possibly <coughs> of himself, <laughs> I think probably subconsciously, maybe not consciously, but subconsciously, his subconscious knows something's up. Okay. You said talking about the subconscious. Maybe he thought that was just a sign of his time is up. Maybe he thought it was a sign of his time being up. I, I, I like... Uh, Jennifer's comment and, and putting it together with some of your others we read this and we go eh? you know I've had scarier dreams my daughter has had scarier dreams sleep. yeah you know what's the what's the bit you know, don't lose sleep but you talk Jennifer about there when you know when it's when God is trying to get a hold of your brain trying to get your attention he could make a feather floating down and just gently touch a little ripple on a pond and you could wake up in sweats because he has put something he's getting your attention God Almighty is knocking on your brain going hello I got something for you you don't know who's knocking you don't know that God he hasn't revealed himself to you you don't even know that it is a God you don't know anything. You know, I, there used to be a time when, you, when I was like a little kid and had to, remember in San Francisco, we had the back porch taking out garbage. I was probably like six years old, maybe whatever. Anyway, a little bit by five. Taking out garbage, you had to go out the back porch and then you went this way downstairs into the basement. And down to the basement was, you had to go way down to the basement to turn the light on and the garbage was right there by the, you put it in there, right? And then you would turn around and you'd come back up. Well, this is San Francisco. I'm a little kid. It's dark down there because you could only turn the top light on. So you, as soon as you dump the, the trash, as soon as I jump dump the trash and you put run the lid back up. Run. No, because you know why? Because it would chase you. Because you had that. On the back of your neck as you're coming up. <laughs> and so you, could, you, couldn't be, you couldn't be too fast because then you showed fear. But, but you, you had that thought in the back. You know, that type, I mean, th I mean, that's my mind when I was a kid. You had, to, you have to believe that there's something there to have the fear. Something, God had to have done something to Nebuchadnezzar to put some trouble in the dream. Something that was <sighs> on the back of his neck, so to speak, that put that like breath of death chill, I would imagine, in, in him. Something there had to have been something so I like that comment about that we, we you know you get up and you wrestle with it What was that about whoa? And then you fall back to sleep and you have the same dream again And it's the same feeling again and you wake up and you And you go back you finally get back to sleep and you do it again and again and again and you're just getting beat up so Head of gold Chest arm silver belly thighs bronze legs iron feet clay and iron Big rock comes down. It, has, it was not cut out of the mountain with human hands. It just comes out, it comes down, destroys, crushes everything, and grows to be big, and the whole world is filled with this big, gigantic rock mountain thing. Okay. And so Daniel, <laughs> so, so Daniel ends this with, that's what you dreamt. Now, I would imagine Nebuchadnezzar is already pretty impressed. He knows that whatever's coming next really is what it, what it is. Because that was his test, right? He said it would be trustworthy. Okay, the interpretation is trustworthy. So let's, let's go to the next one. Let's see, okay, well, he's revealed the dream. Now let's reveal the meaning. What does this thing mean? Starting in verse 37. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are that head of gold. After you, 
Another kingdom will rise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that feet and toes were part, partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a, king, a divided kingdom. Yet it will, be, it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with the clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of, the, out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. <laughs> Pretty good dream. Mm -hmm. Pretty good meaning. So Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head. After that, three kingdoms, each more inferior than the one before. They're declining in power and glory and dominion. It ends with a fourth kingdom that has iron and clay. It's both strong and brittle. It divides over time and it's a mixture. The people are not united. And at that time, in that era, that, that kingdom, that whatever, the rock is going to come out and is going to crush that kingdom. And as a result of crushing that kingdom, it will crush all the ones that were before it. They will all be into, turned into dust and you'll have nothing other than this rock. And his kingdom will be the kingdom that God has established. It will be remain forever. It will go to no other people. It will be forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Right? Pretty simple. So what's the big deal? Well, that's about as shocking to Nebuchadnezzar as his dream is to us. Is it, is it really earth-shaking that a kingdom is going to be someday taken over by another kingdom, is someday going to be taken over by another kingdom, and is someday going to be taken over by some other kingdom. I mean, hasn't that been going on since the time of Noah? The shocking part is that Daniel's God knew his dream. And interpreted it. It had nothing to do with anything other than that. Like God was just... <laughs> God was just <laughs> to power than his kingdom or his... Uh, well, we look at this. You're, 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 all, you're all hitting good points. And I'm going to start with yours, Larissa. The idea that, that there's a greater power over Nebuchadnezzar's power. Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's all that. He thinks he is the supreme being of all things. He's the god of his own world. Uh, but there is another god who is saying, uh, guess what there, dude? You're, you're not. You're, we're going to pull you up short. Someday you're going to be taken over by another kingdom, and that kingdom will be taken over by another kingdom, and that kingdom will be taken over by another kingdom, and then when that kingdom comes, I'm going to set up my kingdom, and my kingdom nobody will take away, and it will last forever and ever and ever and ever. I am the supreme being. So yes, Larissa's correct in that. That is part of the message. But go back to what you said. What is the, what is, what is the big deal? What, is it, what did you say again? Say it again. That Daniel's God knew his dream and what it meant. Yes. That means he gave him this. That Daniel, Daniel's God, the revealer of mystery, is the one who's in control. He's the one that reveals the dreams and the futures and the hearts of men, all the plans. He's the one that sets it up. God knew what you did not know. 
It made it real to the king. It made it real to the king. It made Daniel's God real to the king. Alive. It made, it made Daniel's God alive yes. to this king who thought he was all that. All those are very good. And he said so. He's, who said so? Nebuchadnezzar. Well, not yet, mother. <laughs> what, Daniel finishes this in the last part of 45. He says, The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and the interpretation is trustworthy. Why? You just said it. Why is the dream true and the interpretation trustworthy? How would Nebuchadnezzar know that that is a true statement? Because there's no man that can do this. Because no man could have told the dream and then given an interpretation of it. Right. Exactly. This is not really, it's not primarily about the various kingdoms and identifying the kingdoms. We all can do that. We all, from this vantage point, can look back and go, okay, well, if Nebuchadnezzar was that king, that's a Babylonian kingdom, the next one that bounced him off was the Medes and the Persians, and we'll get to that later, and that kingdom, and then there was the Greeks and Alexander the Great, so that must have been the torso, but, and, and then there was the Roman Empire and, and all that. We can get into all that. There's problems with doing that, though. I don't think that's because it doesn't perfectly fit history, biblical history. I think it's future. Even it may be even it may be future. We but the point I'm trying to make is is like you said, the issue is not who the kingdoms are. The issue is that God revealed that He is the one that did it. That He is the one that interprets mysteries. And Nebuchadnezzar now knows Daniel's God, mm -hmm. at least in part. So how does Nebuchadnezzar respond? What is his response? Starting in verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, surely... Your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the provident province of Babylon, while Daniel has himself remained at the royal court. End of chapter 2, end of act 4. The play is finished, we close the book, and everybody claps and stands, give them, the actors come out and they bow. However, there's only one actor. Who's the actor? God. Who is this whole play about? God. It's all about God. All about God. The God of gods. The Lord of Kings, the Revealer of Mysteries. How many times? Look, look through from like from thirty six on. How many times the God of Heaven has given? He has placed. He has made. The God of Heaven will. The Great God has shown. Who's doing this? God. God. This whole thing is about God. Now that we're at the end of the play, so what's the lesson? What's the purpose of chapter 2 and this particular story? Why did God put this play into action? I would like to see if you can come up with the answer. This is where we're going to wrap it up, okay? I'm going to give it to you in three parts, and you tell me when you get it. The first part you're going to get from the Magician's Confession. So go back to verses. <laughs> yes, that is what they say. She already knows the answer to this question. Oh, well, it's not a hard question. <laughs> well, let's find out. Let's find out if you got it then, if it's not a hard question. The magician's confession in verses 10 through 11. This is the first part of it. The astrologers answered the king, There is not a man on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however, great or mighty, 
has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. That's one side of this. The other side of this is Daniel's reply to the king, and that comes in verse 27 and 28. Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Yeah. Get that so far? Mm -hmm. Those are your two bookends. So where do you find the answer? There's a no. tissue behind you. The, the, the answer is in every, every, the beginning and between and the end. The whole thing. The answer is in one verse. It's in verse 20. What does verse 20 say? Wisdom and power. Remember when I asked you the question, why do you trust in the sovereignty of God? Why do you trust in His power and authority to do whatever it is that He is going to do? Why do you trust that? The reason, because He has infinite wisdom. Wisdom is God's compass for His authority. It is the thing that governs and restricts and defines, if you would. Nice catch. <laughs> and that was with your bad hand. <laughs> God's infinite wisdom. I, and I, I have never really thought about this until this chapter. And so I'm asking you, spend a little bit of time right now, think about this. Sovereign God, able to do anything, has the power to do anything, everything. Nothing is impossible for Him. Right? Why, why do we pray to Him? God, Father, change my circumstance. Help me. Rescue me. Fix this problem. Help my husband. Help my wife. Help my sick child. Help the person who has the illnesses in the hospital and the cancer. Help the person that, that is completely, completely, totally lost and is rebellious against you. Help them. Why, would, why do we trust in that? He's the only one that can do it. Because of his wisdom. Because, yeah. Knowledge is power, baby. It's more than it's more than knowledge. It's more than knowledge. It's more than knowledge. I know he is the only one that can do it. We give it to him, but we rest. Let me rephrase that. We should rest in his sovereign power. I'll give you an example. Let me let me read a couple things from uh, a couple things from A. W. Tozer. If you've never, by the way, I don't usually plug a book but it's an old book. If you have never read The Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer, I suggest that you do it. It, would, it is a wonderful, wonderful book. But don't read more than one chapter at a sitting. It's too much. It is too rich. It'll take, Tozer takes you and he just throws your thoughts as high as humanly possible into the nature and the, the infinity, infinitude of God and just, just makes you just go, wow. It's just one of those types of books. So if you, if you get a chance, I would do that. But he has one in there on the wisdom of God, the attributes. They're all about attributes of God. But here's, here's part of what he says. The idea of God as infinitely wise is at the root of all truth. The whole history of the world is discovered to be but a contest between the wisdom of God and the cunning of Satan and fallen man, which is what we've been seeing in chapter 2. And in the end, there is no doubt who the winner is. He goes on, he says, Wisdom, among other things, is the ability to devise perfect ends and to achieve those ends by the most perfect means. It sees the end from the beginning, so there can be no need to guess or conjecture. 
Wisdom sees everything in focus, focus, each in proper relation to all, and is thus able to work toward predestined goals with flawless precision. All God's acts are done in perfect wisdom. Not only could his acts not be better done, a better way to do them could not be imagined. Now here's the irony. Here's where we meet on this subject. We pray, Lord, please bring this change. Please help this situation. Rescue my friend or whatever. We, we, we call on the power of God, the authority of God, to come and effect some change in our prayers. But do we grant him the right to do it in his wisdom? That's his wisdom. Timing is his wisdom. The means. Remember what he said. Tozer says. He sees the end at the very beginning. He knows where he's going. He knows the objective. He knows that moment and whatever that's going to be. He also knows every single step along that way. And it's the best way. There is no better way. It is the most perfect way because his wisdom is perfect and he sees every possibility, every nuance, every option, every heart, every change and breath of beat of a butterfly, I mean everything. He knows it all. He can take it all into consideration, put it all in relationship and goes, this is the best route here to there. Not only is that the best thing, but that's the best way to get there. Because I know he can say that. Yet when we pray, and God says, no, this one's going to die. I'm not going to heal this one. You're not well, hard you're, you're not, yeah, you're not praying hard enough. Or we get angry at God. How come you're not doing it my way? You, you, I, I mean, I remember this. I, I remember sitting down with, having night prayer and when I, I was unemployed for a long time and I'm sitting there and I'm going, you're all powerful in my prayer. I'm, you're all powerful. I know it is nothing for you to get me a job. All you got to do is blink. Just, just, just say anything. I mean, it takes nothing for you to get me a job. Why won't you get me a job? I've been praying for three years. How come you won't get me a job? It is nothing. What is a big deal? Give me a job. I am angry at you. Ooh. Well, what do I not understand? The big picture. I'm not understanding. It's his wisdom. I'm denying his wisdom. I'm saying, God, I know better. God, I, I know more. God, you sit on the, on the witness stand. Let me ask you some questions there, buddy. Isn't that what I'm doing? When I put that argument before God, you haven't done it. You're not doing it right. You're not doing it the way I want it done. What if I changed my prayer? Lord, I put it before you and, and I know that you have the power to do it. I know you have the ability. Lord, but give me patience to, to, to wait on your way, the best way, the most perfect way. Help me to, to accept that and acknowledge and praise you that whatever's going on, no matter how, how unfathomable, I'm, I don't understand it. I'm, I'm Daniel. I'm in a very strange land. I thought I was okay kid, and I'm now a eunuch, and I'm in, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away in a foreign land, a foreign nation, and I don't, I'm, where's, where's my family? And, and uh, you know, I, did I do something wrong? I don't understand this. What are you doing, God? I could be that way. Or I could say, you know, I don't understand, but that's okay. That's what's the way it's supposed to be. I'm a creature. You are creator. Your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. We are so different I just, like David, I praise you for your wisdom and your power. That's the next one, Peter. I'm glad you mentioned that one. That's why you heard me. Did you say, thy will be done? Yeah. Really? That's my next irony on this one. 
That was the first. Here's the second one. Who, in the, who has ever prayed the prayer, Lord, I, I really want you to do this. I, I pray that if it be your will, change this. Do, th do this. Lord, Lord, I really, really, you're, you're passionate about it. You want to change. Lord, please have this happen. Please have this. Please move in on this situation and make it. But not my will, Lord. Let, let thy will be done. Who in all of history has ever been able to say that and understand what they just said? Jesus. Only one. Jesus is the only one that's been able to say that. And know what it meant to say, Thy will be done, not mine. Yeah. He knew what was coming. We don't. If we, do, if we did know, would we really say, Lord, thy will be done if, you know, not my will, but your will be done? Would we really say that? If we understood the wisdom that God is going to use to bring about or to not bring about whatever it is that we've put before him? No way. We tack that thing on. How could God's will not be done? How could, but that's, that's true. How could God's will not be done? But at the same time, we are asked to, in God's economy of things, we're asked to enter into agreement with it. I want to walk in His will, not contrary to His will. Yes, in the end, God's will is done. But at the same time, when we ask it, with God on it. yeah, we want to be on God's side with it. But when we ask such things, it's it's... I think we often just tack it on kind of like in Jesus' name, amen. As if you, if you don't put that clause on the end of something, you, the prayer doesn't quite get to heaven or something. And when we say, thy will be done, we really don't mean that. Because when we say that, and God says, fine, it will be 15 years before you get your answer. Month two, month three, we're sitting there going, what are you doing, God? Where are you? We want Is that not true? Do we not all do that? That's true. 100% true. Why? Because we're not giving God credit for His infinite wisdom to go with His infinite sovereignty. We don't trust. We don't trust His wisdom. How about this last one? We read His Word or we read in His Word all of His mighty acts and know His declared end, God's sovereignty. Yet we fail to trust Him and follow the method, methods and means in reaching that end. How do I know wisdom? How do I know what God's mind is, what His right and wrong is? His Word. His Word. I know what the end is, I'll gladly say he wins in the end. Mm -hmm. Right? Jesus, come again. Be the king. King, king, lords, lords. We sing it, you know, hallelujah on, 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 on uh, Christmas, uh, Handel's Messiah, the whole bit. We get all excited about the end, but God says, well, right now, this is how I want you to get there. This is what I want you to do. This is my wisdom now. Oh, well, you know, that's really old stuff. That's back then stuff. Archaic. That's archaic. That's not important. I, I think I, it doesn't really apply to me. It's not really all that, you know, like this. It's, it's more just, that's more of a general suggestion that God gave. That was the culture back then, et cetera, et cetera. Any of those, pick any of those and start. So we go, ah, this pen, this page. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that, was, that was to Israel. How about, I know what your word says, but it's kind of, you don't understand my circumstances. You don't oh. feel what I feel. Yeah, there's another one. You know, yes, yes, I know what the Bible says about, about this circumstance, but... You know, you just don't understand all the nuances that are around it. You know, so I really can't do this. I have to do something else. We do that all the time. With, I mean, even little itty bitty things, we do this. Where they are not living with you. There's no little sins. Well, 
you're you're right. There are no little sins, but this, but this, but have you have you noticed that we just don't take the word as God's word? It is His revealed wisdom, and we just it's we can take it or leave it. Sometimes, flip over to Isaiah forty-one, and this is where we will close. Isaiah chapter forty-one. This is God speaking. It's on page uh, 1123 in the Black Bibles. We're going to start in verse 21. God, God is speaking. He says, Present your case, says the Lord. Set forth your arguments, says Jacob's king. Bring in your idols to tell us what is going to happen. Tell us what the former things were, so that we may consider them and know their final outcome. Or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds, so we may know that you are gods. Do something, whether good or bad, so that we will be dismayed and filled with fear. Huh. But you are less than nothing, and your words are utterly worthless. He who chooses you is detestable. Who, who is he talking about? 21, verse 21 through 24. And what? Isaiah what? Isaiah 41. <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> A little behind. <laughs> I am so sorry. Do we need to read it again? Yes. Okay, let me read it again. Isaiah 41, chapter, or chapter 41, starting in verse 21. Present your case, says the Lord. Set forth your arguments, says Jacob's king. Bring in your idols to tell us what is going to happen. Tell us what the former things were, so that we may consider them and know their final outcome. Or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds, so we may know that you are gods. Do something, whether good or bad, so that we may be dismayed and filled with fear. But you are less than nothing and your works are utterly worthless. He who chooses you is detestable. Bring in your idols. Bring in all that you, th you want to raise up, your, your intellectual, philosophical, whatever, imaginary gods. Bring them on in. And what is, this, what is the test? What does God say do? Tell us the future. Tell us the future and tell us the past and let us consider it. Let us weigh this thing. Give us great ponderings of previous times and, and what will happen in the future and let us weigh how great a God you truly are. Why is he saying this? Can any gods no. do this? No. 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 The only God, the only revealer of mysteries, is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, the revealer of mysteries, the God in heaven. The one true God. So we go back and ask the question again. Who do you choose and why? Who and why do you trust in the sovereign authority and power of the God of gods and Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries? Daniel says, because his wisdom is perfect. Because his power is balanced with perfect understanding, perfect knowledge, perfect ability to see everything in all nuances and how they all relate together and know what is best, what's the best end, and what's the best way to get there. So when we pray, we pray, yes, God, come change. God, bring your power to bear upon the circumstance. But God, we understand that it's in your wisdom that we will see this happen. Help us to see your wisdom. Isn't that what James said? 
chapter 1 of James? Take it with joy. Consider it all joy. When the trials and testing come, the multiple trials come, and if any of you lacks wisdom, ask of God, believing that He's going to give it to you. And He will. Why wisdom in a time of trial? Because we don't see the method, the means, all the avenues, all the little extensions, all the, the circumstances and nuances. We just want to get to the end. God, take this away. Get us out. Get us through the fire. Well, what you just described was Daniel's position. He didn't know the answer at first. Right. He so had what, to get it from God himself. Yes, and he did exactly what James was doing. He is facing the death penalty. And he goes and asks mercy of God. Why? Like Ed said, because God's the only one that can answer the, and rescue, provide the power to do it. However, he also knows that it's because of God's perfect wisdom that this is happening exactly the way it is happening, even though he may not understand it. He says, he, didn't he tell Nebuchadnezzar, I don't have any greater wisdom than the people that are around me. But I know someone who does. Yeah, that's the, that's the keys right there to me. So there you go. He knew where to go. <laughs> he knew where to go. But it wasn't just about God's power to deliver, power to change. It was also about his ability to see into the heart and to see into the mind, to see in the future, to see all things and know all things, understand all things, and provide that wisdom to Daniel. Do you think it pleases God when you ask or pray for wisdom on account of um, all of that, what you just said, and the fact that he blessed Solomon with not only wisdom and the more wise than anybody else, but also all the riches. So, I mean, you would think that's something kind of huge for God, the whole wisdom thing. Uh, the idea about Solomon asking for wisdom and, and is that a... Do uh, you think God... Or do I think that God honors that when we ask of it? I think that is true. I think God does honor it uh, because he tells us to in James. We just read... We just mm -hmm. talked about that. But understand that wisdom in a human capability, human enabling, is not enough. I may have all the wisdom in the world, but I may be the foolish, most foolish man. Because I understand wisdom, or because I have wisdom, doesn't mean that I'm going to act on that wisdom. So there's a, there's a, there's a difference there. Solomon was the wisest man to ever live, other than Christ. But he was the foolish, most foolish man when it came to someone who was so wise. He was told, don't marry other nations' wives. Don't do that, because it will pull you away from God. So what does he do? How about a thousand of them? Let's just hang out, ah, come on. At what point did he, did he let go and his heart turned away from the wisdom and said, I just don't want to follow it anymore? So perhaps that would be another part of our prayer is, Lord, is not only come and bring your power to bear, your sovereign power to bear on this circumstance, give me wisdom to understand how to get through this particular time and to, to be walking with you in your time, in your way, through your method during this time according to your wisdom. But Father, give me a willing heart to do the walk, to follow that wisdom. Amen. And maybe that would be a, a little bit more complete prayer. Let's pray. Father God, Lord,